Good morning. Go ahead and take a seat. And as you do so, uh, take your Bibles or your apps or whatever you read on uh, and turn to Proverbs chapter 20. Proverbs chapter 20. Now, we've been in this series, How Not to Be an Idiot. It's been a, a several week study of uh, the book of Proverbs and the wisdom uh, that it gives us. And uh, this is the last of that series. Uh, we're going to be starting a new series next week. So uh, come join us for that. Um, now, today I have a guest with me. Uh, this is Pastor Ted. He is our pastor of recovery here at Calvary. Um, and we have a great program that meets every Monday night at 6.30 called Celebrate Recovery. And Celebrate Recovery, obviously we've got some fans. Celebrate Recovery, we, we talk about it, we, we refer to it regularly. Uh, if you uh, have heard us ever talk about CR, uh, that is uh, our, our abbreviation for Celebrate Recovery here at Calvary. Uh, but Celebrate Recovery is basically a program that's designed to help you with any life issues or sin issues, uh, such as uh, overeating, undereating, gambling, uh, um, uh, any kind of sin addiction that you may be dealing with, codependency. Uh, but it also deals with chemical addictions, such as uh, alcoholism or drug addiction. And of course, uh, Pastor Ted leads that ministry here at Calvary for us. Um, and uh, again, that meets on Monday nights at 6.30. You're going to hear that a lot today uh, because we're a big fan of Celebrate Recovery and what it does here at Calvary. Um, but our recovery pastor is here with us uh, because we're going to be talking about addiction, not just addiction to alcohol or drugs, uh, but to sin in general. And so um, let's begin with talking about our stories because Ted and I have some interesting perspectives um, on this particular issue, and so we'd like to share a little bit of that with you. Uh, so Ted, why don't you start by telling us your story? Sure. If you were at Celebrate Recovery this morning, you would hear something like this. My name is Ted. I'm a grateful follower of Jesus Christ, and I'm re in recovery for alcoholism. You know, I had the privilege of being raised in a Christian home. My parents were church-going people. If the doors of the church were open, we were there. Sunday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. We took what we did. We went to church. But as a teenager, I began to rebel against that routine, and I had my own ideas of how I wanted to live my life. And about 15 years old, a neighbor, an adult neighbor of ours, offered me my first beer. And that began a 40-year journey spiraling down into the depths of alcoholism that took pretty much everything that I held important to me. Now, you talk about this journey of alcoholism, this, this road that you went down, and you talk about it taking things from you. Talk to us a little bit about what that looked like in your life. Well, my drinking soon spilled over into my family life. You know, and my wife, about 15 years into our marriage, reached the point where the emotional abuse that came with my drinking was beginning to be more than she could handle and she had to make a choice. She could either stay in that emotional uh, abusive relationship or she could take my sons and leave. She chose to leave. You know, and that led to a second marriage, another alcohol-related marriage. Of course, this time I married a cocktail waitress that meant that I could drink for free. And living the dream for an alcoholic, <laughs> right? Yeah, well, <laughs> at least for a short time. But alcohol soon destroyed that relationship as well and led to a third marriage. You know, and that third marriage was in trouble because of my drinking again. You know, well, about the mid-90s, my situation got worse. You know, I began to realize that I had a problem, that I was out of control. I, was, I wasn't able to control my drinking. You know, I was having, my marriages had failed. Relationships with my children had deteriorated. My youngest son didn't want much to do with me. And my third marriage was in an alcohol spiral that was about to be, about to end. You know, and I was pretty much alone. But surely I wasn't an alcoholic, not me. I didn't drink at work. I could control my drinking if I chose to. I just chose not to. And besides, I just liked the, the taste of beer. You know? But I couldn't quit. I was in trouble. But looking back now at step one of the 12 steps of recovery, it goes something like this. We admitted we were powerless over our addictions and compulsive behaviors, and our lives had become unmanageable. That pretty well summed up my life at that point out of control and unmanageable. And I had to make that decision. I would look in the mirror and tell that guy in the mirror that I saw in the morning, you're an alcoholic. Now, Ted's story is the flip side of the coin from my story because I've never struggled with alcohol use or addiction or anything like that, but I was the child of someone who did. 
Um, so uh, my story is that, you know, growing up, I grew up in a household where my father was very abusive. Um, and to be quite honest, I don't know that you could, uh, that the world would look at my biological father and say, oh, he's an alcoholic, but alcohol played a role in the abuse that played out in my household. Uh, so whether you would have labeled him as an alcoholic or not, alcohol was a factor uh, in why that was destructive in my own life. So when I was in first grade, my mom divorced my biological father. We moved to another town. Uh, my mom started dating another man and married him. Um, and he was just in the beginning steps of getting cleaned up from alcohol and drug abuse. And his story was that he got introduced to alcohol at like five or six years of age by his own dad. And, and so he lived an entire lifespan, like from childhood in through adulthood, uh, addicted to alcohol and then addicted to drugs. Um, and so when my mom married him, he was beginning the process through Alcoholics Anonymous to get cleaned up and change his life. Um, and, and he got cleaned up and, and uh, he passed away about five years ago, but something like two or three years ago, he would have been sober for 30 years. Mm -hmm. um, had a great testimony, uh, but in his uh, early stages of getting cleaned up, um, he had a company that he owned and, and was uh, you know, relatively successful. And so he decided he was going to help those who were also trying to get cleaned up from alcohol and drug abuse. And so he took people into our house um, and would feed them, give them a place to live, and give them a job uh, for several months at a time in order for them to get back on their feet and recover from alcohol or drug abuse. So at my middle school and high school years uh, were filled with uh, guys struggling to get clean in and out of our household all the time. Um, and so I saw the effects uh, of what alcohol and drugs could do to a person and how it could destroy their lives uh, from looking from the outside in. Um, and so that's kind of uh, where my story be uh, went. But um, I told you to turn to Proverbs chapter 20. Let's look at what the Bible has to say about addiction uh, and things. So Prover Proverbs chapter 20, and we're going to look at verse 1. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 1. Now remember, Proverbs is written from a father to his sons. Uh, and it's basically this father saying, I've learned all these things through the years. I want you to gain something from my uh, experience, from my wisdom and knowledge. And so he writes these words of wisdom. And he doesn't exactly sugarcoat things when he comes to talking about alcohol. So look at Proverbs 20, verse 1. He says, wine is a mocker. And strong drink is a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. <laughs> so, so that's what the writer of Proverbs has to say. But let's be honest, uh, everyone's story is different, isn't it? Um, I mean, just look at two pastors here at Calvary who have had very polar opposite experiences with alcohol. Um, you know, everybody's different here. Uh, you know, your struggle may be different than Ted's. It may be different than mine. Uh, you know, Ted struggled directly with alcohol and it, how it affected his life. I struggled from the viewpoint of being affected by someone's alcoholism uh, and drug abuse. But some of you are in this room going, you know, I've never dealt with alcohol or drugs. It's not something I've ever struggled with. But let's be honest, everyone in this room has dealt with sin. Uh, because every single one of us, every person ever born on the face of the planet has struggled and is currently struggling with sin. Um, and so the fact is, is that whether you've dealt with alcohol or drugs or you've never dealt with those things, we've all dealt with a sin. I bet if I surveyed this room, every single one of us in this room could say, you know, there is this sin that seems to be a daily struggle in my life. It's almost as if my sinful heart is addicted to that sin, right? Every single one of us could say, whether it's pride, or it's gossip, or it's greed, or it's anger and outbursts of anger, every single one of us are addicted to some kind of sin. And so this message, some of you are going, oh, they're talking about alcohol abuse. I don't have to listen to this. Yeah, you do. Because every single one of us struggles with some kind of sin in their lives. You know, if you go into the Bible, this is what it has to say about uh, alcohol and drug abuse and, and that particular thing. 
Um, If you go look at Ephesians chapter 5, I'm not going to read it directly, but you can look it up later. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 18 says that drunkenness is where the Bible draws the line. You see, the Bible does not condemn drinking. It doesn't say that you should never have an alcoholic drink ever in your life. It says that getting drunk is the thing that actually is the line that we should not cross. And if you go into Ephesians 5.18, it talks about that when we get into drunkenness, when we are drunk, that we make bad decisions. The the word that our ESV version uses is debauchery. Uh, We get into all sorts of trouble. And I bet most of us in this room can think back to a time when we drank and we made bad decisions, right? Uh, I mean, isn't that kind of the stereotype of what goes on in our lives and and who we are? Um, We make horrible decisions decisions when we get drunk and that's why the bible says don't get drunk that's the line it says do not cross now the word drunk drunkenness in the greek was not just applying to alcohol the greeks were very aware the romans were very aware of drugs Uh, drugs are not a new thing in society drugs have been around for thousands of years Uh, the romans and the greeks knew that there were certain plants that you could ingest And it would make you have hallucinations. It would alter the way you think. It would do all sorts of things to you. And so the word in the New Testament that's used here uh, actually refers to any substance that alters your thinking. And so this passage applies to any drugs, alcohol, anything that we do in our lives that changes the way we make decisions and the way we think. Um, But the Bible makes it clear that we have been set free, right? Right? The Bible says once you've been set free, you're free indeed. But if you also go and look in Romans and 1 Corinthians, Ephesians, Philippians, there there are many passages that also talks about how once we've been set free, we're supposed to turn our back on the life of slavery to sin that we lived before. Which means that we are still, as followers of Christ, we can still live enslaved to sin if we don't continually fight against sin. You know, we have to continually resist those temptations and not be living actively in our sin. And so that's also what we're going to be talking about this morning is we're not just talking about alcohol abuse or drug abuse. We're talking about being enslaved to something that Christ calls us not to be enslaved to. We're set free and we're supposed to live in the freedom that Christ gives us rather than living in the slavery that sin binds us in. And so that's what we're talking about all together today, is just being free from those addictions of either chemicals or those addictions of uh, the sins that we can be enslaved by. So let's be honest, I checked his breath this morning and he is not drunk. Um, So obviously there is a turn that has taken place in your story. So tell us the rest of your story, Ted. Well, about 1998, I retired from a police department in the L.A. area, and we moved to Lake Havasu. We'd had a place here for about six years, so we were well entrenched into the parties, party system and the party t- uh, atmosphere in Lake Havasu. And my plan was to sit on my boat, drink my beer, and watch God's creative handiwork go by on the boats in the channel. Now, well, <laughs> nobody's moved to Havasu for that reason, right? <laughs> nobody's done that. <laughs> but the truth was I was miserable because I was struggling with my alcohol addiction. I was struggling with not being able to stop, and I was struggling with that thought process of, I can't control this, being totally out of control of what was going on around me. And so I was struggling with this in the process. You know, one Sunday my wife says, we ought to go to church. My first reaction was, why? <laughs> and then it was, well, okay, if, you know, happy wife, happy life, so we went to church. And we found ourselves on November of 1990 in this little church on the south side of town, tucked back into the back of the lot. And on the way home that morning, I realized that this is the place where I belonged, that I had found a place that I could go and reconnect with God, where I could redevelop that relationship that, that my mom and dad had raised us with and taught us with. You know, and this, they had this young curly-haired little pastor there that was guiding not me. Not me, by the way. <laughs> Just FYI, in case you were wondering, that's not me. But he was encouraging me and guiding me in this process of, of working towards sobriety. And so we began to become regular attenders at the church. I joined the, 
the music ministry at the church, and we began to work on my alcohol addiction at that time. Then one night, unable to sleep, I turned to God. And I just pleaded with God. I said, God, I can't, I can't do this anymore. I can't change. I can't break this habit myself. I need your help. If you're listening, please take away this desire I have for alcohol. And with God's help on September the 9th, 2000, some 17 years ago now, I stopped drinking. And God has, God has been part of my life since then. Now, it hasn't been an easy journey. It's been difficult at times. There's been a lot of bumps in the road, a lot of difficult times. But today, I'm living a Christ-centered, sober, productive life that God has given me and as, a, as an opportunity to be able to give back. You know, he's restored many of the relationships that I destroyed, the, the relationships with my children, with my family, with my friends. He's given me new godly friends that hold me accountable to my sobriety. And most importantly, he's restored the relationship with my beautiful little redhead. <laughs> That's awesome. What a great story. Uh, what a testimony to the rest of us here, right? Now, some of you are listening to Ted's story, and you're listening to my story, and you're going, you know what? I can directly identify with what you're saying. And some of you are saying to yourself, what can I do? And maybe you're asking yourself right now, I can identify with what you're saying. So what can I do? What's the next step? Uh, where do I go from here? If I want to have victory over this addiction or this sin issue that I struggle with, what can I do? Well, let me give you the first step. The first step is simply this recognize that there is a problem recognize that there is a problem um, and if you are trying to recognize as ted has said you know ted mentioned you know i went through this process of trying to figure out whether i was an alcoholic or not if you're trying to figure that out here are a couple questions that may help you understand whether you've got a problem either with uh, with a substance or with uh, a sin that you're struggling with and here's the first one are you in control or are you being controlled? In other words, uh, is your drinking or your drug abuse, is the sin that you struggle with controlling you? you know, it could be something as big as what we're talking about with alcohol or drugs, or it could be something seemingly minor like gossip or greed or anger. You know, do, it, do, do you have this tendency to lose control over that sin when that temptation is there? Uh, and if you do, then that's a sign that you probably need to take the step and recognize that there actually is a problem. You know, in my own life, I've had to deal with anger and pornography and uh, pride. And there were times in my life when I realized in all of those issues that I was not in control. Uh, I would have outbursts of anger and realize that just overtook me. I didn't control that. And I needed to go to someone and say, I recognize that I have a problem here. Now, another way to recognize if there's a problem is what are the people around you saying? Uh, are people bringing up this particular issue with you because they've seen it in your life? Do people talk about, hey, you know, you're drinking a lot or, or you've got this drug problem or, man, your, your anger has really taken over. You're such an angry person or, or you know, this gossip is not healthy for us. We need, to, we, not, we need to put that behind us and not do that anymore. Are there people in your life that are talking to you about this issue because if they're bringing it up there's a pretty good uh, likelihood that there's a problem that you need to begin to recognize <clears throat> but the big step after recognizing that there's a problem is to get help you want to talk about that a little bit ted sure you know no doubt there's somebody here this morning that has a similar issue as i have or or you're struggling with another addiction or you're struggling with being out of control in your life you know, you're enslaved to the addiction and compulsive behaviors that are ruling your life. You know, your life is unmanageable, out of control. Or maybe perhaps you're just in denial. The people around you know you have a problem, but you're in denial, denying that there's anything wrong. But there's hope. Our God is a loving God, and he's a God of second chances, fortunately for me. You know, and he's waiting for you to take that first step. Cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. He's willing to bear that burden for you. It's not always going to be easy. In fact, there's going to be times, like in my life, where it was very difficult. But the fact is that you can make a difference. You can change. But take a look around you. What is it costing you in your addiction or compulsive behavior at this point? Does it cost you a spouse? Cost you your children, family relationships, maybe your friends? 
You know, are they tired of your antics, tired of your abuse, your emotional abuse? You know, there's something that can be done. You know, if you've reached the bottom and you know that there's no way other to go but up, then it's time to make that change. And if you earnestly want to change, earnestly seek God as I did, you will be able to find him. He's promised that. In Proverbs 8, 34, 36, it says, Blessed are those who listen to me, watching daily at my doors, waiting at my doorway. For those who find me find life and receive favor from the Lord. But those who fail to find me harm themselves. There's only one failure in this process, and that's not making that choice to seek the Lord. It's your choice, and you must choose. Here at Calvary, we've mentioned it now, we have this incredible program called Celebrate Recovery. It's a 12-step program based on the words of Jesus that are found in the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5. You know, it's for hurts, habits, and hang-ups, not just for chemical abuse. You know, it's for life issues like gambling, sexual addiction, pornography, you know, uh, the, and the chemical issues as well. But it's for all the issues that plague people that they have struggles with. But, you know, Jesus is our higher power. And he is the power that gives us the strength to be able to break the chains that bind us, to be able to break that addiction cycle and help us find healing. We meet at, Cal we meet at Calvary McCulloch campus every Monday night at 6.30. We're there. We have uh, an opportunity for you to come and fellowship with people, come to some place where you can work on your, your struggles. You know, over the 13 years that we've been doing this, we've had literally hundreds of people that have come through Celebrate Recovery and found healing. You know, and I'm, I'm happy to be able to say that it's a place that's safe, that you can come to, where you can come in anonym anonymity, that's a hard one for me to say, <laughs> anonymity and confidentiality are premiums. So, you know, take the opportunity to come and join us there. CR is available, there will be CR people available at the Connection Center to be able to talk to you after this service if you'd like to talk to someone about it. They'll be wearing CR shirts that have got the logo on it. So... Some of you are saying, you know what, I hear what you're saying, but I am actively pursuing a life-changing relationship with Jesus, and I am daily having victory over my sins, and my struggles, my issues, and to you, I would say, praise God, that's amazing, that's awesome, and that's actually where we would love to see the vast majority of people is daily living their life for Christ and living in victory, as the Bible says, over their sins and over their temptations. Um, but I think all of us, or most of us, could probably say, I'm not struggling in that way, but I know someone who's struggling in that way. And you may be asking the question, how can I help someone? If I'm not the person that needs help, how can I help someone else who is hurting or is struggling or is trying to fight an addiction or a sin or a life issue? Um, so how can you help someone? What, what would Ted and I say to you? What would the Bible say about this? Well, first off, be a safe place. Be a safe place for that other person. What do I mean by that? Let me put it this way. You want to be the person that when that guy or that girl decides they want to begin to have victory from their sins or uh, their addictions, and they say, I want to begin the first steps to healing, who should I go to? Who could help me here? You want to be the first person that comes to their mind. You want to be that person that they say in their mind, I know that I could go to this person and they're not going to verbally abuse me or berate me or make me feel horrible about myself. They're going to embrace me, they're going to love me, and they're going to help me find the help that I need to get over this. And so what does that look like? What does it look like to be a safe place? Well, first off, I encourage you, don't be pushy uh, about them getting help. Have you ever heard the old adage, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't yeah, make him drink, drink right? <laughs> and that's true. And Ted will attest to this. You know, growing up in a household where I was surrounded by people who were going through Alcoholics Anonymous all the time, um, you know, we can both tell you that you can take someone to CR, you can take someone to AA, but until they're ready to quit, until they're ready to take those steps and have victory over their addiction, they're not going to quit. Mm -hmm. you, know, you can't force someone to quit. That is a moving of the Holy Spirit within that person. And quite frankly, I'm not the Holy Spirit and neither are you. So we can't bring that change. 
And so I encourage you to bring it up with them and make them aware that there are programs out there, Celebrate Recovery, Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous. There's so many programs that are out there available to give help, but don't push it on them continuously. That's not the only thing that that person should ever hear from you. Uh, Because there's going to come a time where they're going to get tired of it and they're going to walk away from that relationship with you. Um, So understanding that you can't make them change, so don't constantly push it. But also remind them on a regular basis that God wants to redeem their situation. You know, we serve a God who sacrificed his only son so that that son's blood could wash us white as snow. That blood could cleanse us of all of our sins so that we could live in victory through his blood. And not only does he want to redeem our situations, he can and is able. Because I'll be, you know, I've heard it. I know Ted's heard it. There are a lot of people who don't get help because they don't feel like there's any hope. There's no way that I can overcome this addiction. There's no way that I can have victory over this sin. That's what a lot of people believe. But believe me, Ted and I could give you the names of literally hundreds of people who have gained victory through Jesus Christ over their sin and over their addictions. God wants to and he can give us victory. There is no situation so bad that God can't fix it. And that's the message of hope that we have as followers of Christ. And there are people in your life that may need to hear that message of hope, that reassurance that God wants to and has the ability to redeem, to clean up, to give them the hope in their situation that they need. So encourage them. Uh, But there's a fine line that we need to draw here because there's a difference between helping someone and enabling someone. And so, Ted, can you talk to us about the difference between helping and enabling? You know, it's obvious that you can't make someone change. But you can set boundaries and hold them accountable to those boundaries. Don't be an enabler, as Chad said. In other words, if they got fines to pay and they can't, don't pay them for them. If they get arrested and go to jail, that might be where God's going get to get their attention sitting in a jail cell. Don't bail them out every time they Amen. get in trouble. You know, if they break the boundaries or step over those boundaries that you've established, hold the consequences to them. Don't ignore it. Don't overlook it. Basically, what you're doing is if you're doing that is you're saying, well, your behavior is okay. It's okay to do that. And it's not. You know, so you're enabling them to do that. But you can come with them to celebrate recovery. You might even find out you want to be there yourself if you come. <laughs> <laughs> or connect them with counseling services that we have at, at Calvary. We have several counseling services available at Calvary that you can lead them to. Be available to listen. Be available to pray with them and for them. Show them support when they make healthy decisions. You can support them, but you can't fix them. That's something that they have to make a choice to do themselves. And, and Ted said it. That's the next thing. Uh, that we can do to help someone else is support them. Uh, And supporting them is one of the biggest things you can do. And uh, I can say that personally because uh, just a few months ago, I had somebody who uh, I love dearly, very close to me, um, who was struggling with alcohol addiction. Uh, And to support them, I actually went to uh, several Celebrate Recovery and Alcoholics Anonymous meetings with him uh, to help him get the process started. Because think about it. If you're dealing with an addiction or a sin or a life issue, what is scarier than walking into a strange building with a bunch of strange people that already know each other, all there for the same reason and are all gung-ho and they want to meet you and shake your hand? That's a scary, scary scenario. Uh, And so there's not many things that you could do that would be more supportive than going to that first meeting with them and saying, listen... I'll walk with you, I'll sit with you, I'll go through this process with you so that you don't have to do it alone. Uh, There's not many things scarier than being alone in some kind of scenario like that. So um, go through the process with those people, be that support system, help them. Then when the next meeting comes along, you can be the one while they're going, "Eh, I'm not sure I'm going to go. You can go, no, 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 I went to the first one with you. I'm going to the second one. Come on, I'm going to pick you up and I'm going to force you to go. You're going with me. You know, you can be 
that support system for that person. And so don't hesitate to be there and support them. Uh, so let me wrap this up. You know, we all struggle. Uh, every single one of us in this room, we are not perfect, and we don't have the capacity to be perfect. Uh, we are tainted with sin, and we're continually tempted by different sins in our lives. And so I encourage you today to think about what you need to do in your life to have victory over the struggles that you may have. Um, do you need to come to celebrate recovery? Uh, do you need to find somebody to talk to, a, a counselor? Do you need to go to a trusted uh, Christian that you look up to uh, to begin to help hold you accountable and help you walk through the process of having victory over your sin? Um, whatever that first step needs to be today, I encourage you to take it today. If it's Celebrate Recovery, if you go, you know what, I know I need to do this, and, and you feel like God has been speaking to you directly this morning, don't hesitate to grab one of these uh, volunteers from Celebrate Recovery. Go out into the Connection Center after the service and grab one of the people that has a Celebrate Recovery shirt on and begin the process today while, God, while you're listening to what God has to say and the changes that God wants to make in your life. So take those steps. Will you join me in prayer this morning?